Thanks, Torin. Um, I'm delighted that you decided to first tell them that it was Amanda and me and then drinks. And yeah, that's motivating. So um, I've been talking to Kevin. I've uh, bought some of those little mosquito bugs. And if anybody looks like they're sleeping, you're going to get a shot of amphetamine. So I would be very careful if I were you. Um, I took, I, I realized actually when I was trying to prepare for this presentation, I think I've written three or four different presentations and I'm still trying to decide which one I'm going to give you. But I took the doing surveillance studies kind of literally and I thought it would be really kind of fun. At least I found it a really useful exercise for myself and hopefully you'll find it works well. Um, uh, is to reflect back and talk about some of the methodological, ethical and conceptual issues that we faced doing research at the intersection between gender and surveillance in the context of the eGirls Project. Um, the eGirls Project is funded under the Social Science and Humanity Research Council of Canada's Partnership Initiative. Um, I'm working with an amazing team of researchers, which includes Chris Reagan, uh, Jade Bailey, Jackie Burkell, and Jane Tallum. We have incredible students, and I want to tip of my hat to Trevor Milford, who's been working with the project since he was a third year undergrad which tells you how good he actually is. I hired him as soon as I found him. Um, and, and the idea of this project was to interrogate the performance of gender in social media spaces. And typically, my first question in Q&A whenever I talk about the eGirls project is, ah, why gender? Why gender? Why girls? What about boys? Uh -huh. And um, uh, although a number of scholars have pointed out that men and women experience surveillance differently, just think of Clive Norris's findings that a CCTV camera is going to spend a significant portion of its time following hot chicks. Um, as a group of scholars, we have been very slow to examine the gaze as a gendered phenomenon. Um, and, and so my interest, my interest in this intersection between surveillance and gender actually grew out of work I was doing on kids, boys and girls. Um, I began by looking at the ways in which online star sites targeting children are designed to commodify online play and promote particular kinds of identities. Um, the classic example is Barbie Girl, uh, which is no longer up, but it was typical of a branded playground where children interact with virtual characters. These kinds of sites encourage kids to identify themselves, so everything they do on the site can be tracked. They register, and then the site collects all their click stream, any comments they make, any content they share. And then all of that is um, uh, mushed up in a system that, that decides how to uh, use the best behavioral targeting so you can market these children more products. And it's important to remember that this just is in, it's not just advertising we're talking about in these kinds of environments. The goal on these sites that kids inhabit is to learn enough about the child as an individual so the marketer can manipulate the environment around the child and embed commercial messages not just into the environment. It's not about advertising. The idea is to, com to embed the commercial message right into the child's sense of identity. Um, and they do this by creating a friendship between the child and the brand. So Barbie, for example, could call your child on the phone and uh, read, read your child a bedtime story at night. Um, you, on the site, you could talk to Hillary Duff through an interactive video, and Hillary would tell you how Barbie was her big role model, and she was a girl, and how Barbie's just so professional, and she's <laughs> really good for girls to look up to. And, 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 and promoting this, this sense that the brand actually is a personality which they can, a child can engage with and become friends with. Now, the methods I use, similar to Dan's actually, um, I started by doing documentary analysis of legal policies, looking at terms of use um, agreements and, and privacy policies, things like that. Rich uh, documentary data uh, by looking at the material that was addressed to the potential purchasers of the data that was collected on the site. Um, so the advertisers and marketers who wanted to use this. And I combined that by looking at the interactive functionality that was built right into the platform itself, the ways in which on the screen those um, commercial me messages were blended with content created by the child. And again, it was a very gender neutral process. I was looking at kids online, had a lot of kids, didn't want them to go online, decided to see what was happening uh, on, co on kids' sites. Um, and I approached it through a very gender, gender neutral methodology. Um, but the feedback I got from presenting this research at conferences like this and certainly at policy interventions is that the most provocative examples 
always came from sites targeting girls. Even sites targeting boys raised gendered issues about girls. Uh, for example, beer.com was an incredibly popular site with high school boys around 2000, 2001, um, because beer.com featured Tammy the interactive bar uh, tender. Um, Tammy was a composite, it was a video of a real woman, and um, you could go onto the site and you were invited to place your order. So you could actually key in and tell Tammy to do things like, Tammy, why don't you take your clothes off? And then she would. Um, you could ask Tammy to kiss a girl. And then in the video, this interactive video was programmed to, to um, analyze the language that a child had, had put into, the, uh, into the, the order box. And then another girl would come into the video and they would kiss and this type of thing. So even when we were looking at sites that were, were, were designed by marketers to target boys, it raised really interesting questions about the construction of femininity in online spaces. Um, at the same time, gender kept emerging as a key point of analysis in another um, um, research project I was working on, the Young Canadian for the Wired World Research Project. And that project uses qualitative focus group data and quantitative data um, uh, with, through surveys that have been administered to approximately 5,500 kids across the country on three different occasions to track uh, kids' use and experiences of online media. And that data consistently demonstrated that patterns of use of children interacting with media are highly gendered. Now, I'm going to condense this into a nutshell. Um, this data indicates, and it's, it's, it's also supported by similar research projects that have been done in, in, in the UK and in, in the EU and the United States. Girls tend to talk more online. They tend to express themselves and they tend to tell the truth when they're doing this. Boys, on the other hand, tend to talk less online, express themselves less online, and lie. <laughs> um, interestingly <laughs> enough, both of them have very specific uh, privacy strategies. Girls tend to expose more about themselves, but they rely on privacy settings in order to attempt to put up boundaries. Boys lied because that way they put up a boundary. It was a way of playing with the man. I remember talking to this 12-year-old boy in work that I had done with Jackie Burkell, actually, uh, in London, Ontario. And he said, yeah, it's really cool. When you go online, they watch you. So what I do is I lie about myself. And then I wait till I get an ad. And then I try to trace back who they sold my, ad, my information to so I can figure out who's watching me very different kind of surveillance strategy, uh, pardon me, not surveillance, privacy strategy than simply relying on, on privacy settings. Now, putting those two, two, two pieces of research together, the corporate focus on girls' sites began to make a certain amount of sense because girls are de uh, developmentally predisposed to communicate and express themselves. That makes them ideal candidates for a commercial system that trades on their personal information. In fact, their reliance on privacy settings made them even better candidates to be inserted into this corporate system because, by definition, the privacy setting never protects the individual from surveillance that the corporation does. It's just for other people outside. Um, at the same time, I was actively engaged over that decade with policy work, particularly around kids and online media. Um, I participated, as uh, many of us around the room did, um, in the debates around uh, Canada's uh, private sector data protection legislation, PIPEDA. Uh, but I also intervened on a number of issues around media violence and technologically mediated education. And again, in that work, gender emerged as a key factor in the ways in which policymakers talk about and regulate children's online activities. So when we um, when we started the eGirl project, we wanted to get a better insight into all of these different processes. And we started with an analysis of the narratives around kids in media that are contained in parliamentary committee hearings and debates. And it's an incredibly productive methodology. You can use discourse analysis, you can use just straight qualitative analysis, but if you get into that, that pool of data, you often find very surprising things. Now, 
I, I'm curious for those of you who have lived through this debate if you'll, you'll, if these, if these findings will resonate with you. But in the early years of 1995, 1996, 1997, when we still talked about things like the information superhighway, um, <laughs> kids were positioned, the kids in a gender neutral sense, were positioned as the drivers of wealth production. They're early adopters. Who was talking about innovation earlier to, uh, today? Julie, weren't you? They're innovators. Kids are innovators. Um, therefore, you cannot regulate companies that develop kids' sight because we've got kids positioned in this beautiful partnership with companies. They're innovating with the corporate sector to create wealth for the economy of tomorrow. Um, however, a couple of years later, that, now that, 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 that discourse is still quite strong. That child is innovator, that child is savvy surfer, digital native, is still a very, very strong element to the policy discourse, in spite of the fact that over and over again, social science research indicates that kids actually are no better with technology than adults. They know which button to push, but they don't know how to use it very well to do things like learn and communicate and express themselves. They, they are good with the buttons, but not necessarily self-critical about the consequences of their actions. Nonetheless, that, that discourse, as I said, continues to be a dominant part of the policy debates, particularly in Canada. We don't want to regulate and, and we don't want to stop co corporations from putting kids under surveillance. We, that surveillance is economically productive. But a couple of years after talking about this, people started to say, oh, kids can see pornography. <laughs> you know, and they can be mean to each other in line because I'm sure none of you were mean to anyone as children, but it's only the internet that's caused this problem. And, and this, the, a, a parallel discourse emerged in which um, kids were seen as potential victims of these harms. If you put them online, bad things will happen to them. Um, and again, the, the focus typically wasn't on girls or boys, it was on gender, this gender neutral term of children. What's your solution if your child is going to be victimized? You place them under surveillance. They need to be monitored. So on the one hand, we're not going to monitor, we're going to allow the corporations to place them under surveillance because that makes money. We're going to now tell parents, if you're a good parent, you're going to put your kid under surveillance. We're going to tell school, we're going to demand and actually legislate that schools and libraries have to put children under surveillance to protect them because they're potential victims. But as we teased apart this discourse, it became very clear that policymakers weren't talking about kids, they were talking about girls. Um, many of the risks that young people purportedly faced in online spaces, according to this particular narrative, were framed in terms of sexual vulnerability. So we weren't really talking about children per se, we were talking about girls, and they were very particular kinds of girls. They started as being very naive girls. The problem is girls are naive. They don't realize there are predators and pornographers out there. So we need to put them under surveillance to protect them. About a year later, these girls be began to be more annoying. They were <laughs> know-it-all girls. These are not just naive girls, but they think they know everything. So they're trying to avoid our surveillance. So we have to place them under even more aggressive surveillance in order to protect them. Interestingly enough, as that discourse developed, we began to look at girls as provoca provocateurs, as dangerous to boys and men, because these girls' sex images, and I actually, I didn't bring it with me, but I actually have a quote from a Canadian parliamenta uh, parliamentarian that says, what's a 40-year-old guy to do? He gets his sex, he doesn't know she's under 18, and all of a sudden he's gonna be accused of trafficking and child pornography. What about a 15-year-old boy? How was he supposed to stop this, this girl from sending him these images? Um, again, a very, very gendered discussion where girls move from being victims to being the problem that needs to be controlled. So surveillance is no longer being framed as a protective response for children. It's actually being framed in policy discourse as a highly gendered method of social control targeting girls as a unique population. So one of the other things that we've been doing with the eGirls project is we've been collecting qualitative data because as a counterbalance to this particular narrative, we want to get a sense of what girls' online lives actually are like. Do they experience these kinds of harms or these kinds of benefits online? Um, what does this policy mean to them? Does it resonate with their lived experiences? 
And, and, and this became very methodologically fraught in very interesting ways. Um, we started by thinking, oh, we started being really Pollyanna uh, optimistic. You know, we're going to go out there and we're going to see all the ways that girls perform gender in social media spaces. It's going to be great. They'll be astronauts and they'll be professionals and they'll be kids playing with Barbie and all this multiplicity of ways of being girl. Um, so we thought, well, if we want to get it, if we want to devise a discussion guide to get at all these lived experiences, why don't we just do an informal scan, first of all? Let's go on Facebook and get a sense of the kinds of girls that are performed online. And that led to a very, our first ethical problem. Like Dan, we were incredibly uncomfortable doing research on girls by invading their privacy. Especially if you think of my previous research, I was focusing on this manipulative reappropriation of the traces girls leave online by corporations. We felt it was pretty hypocritical for us to just go out and grab it all for our own purposes. Um, so, so we made the same very uneasy decision that you made, Dan. We decided we would focus on publicly available Facebook pages of girls who held themselves out to be between the ages of 17 and 22 who were living in the Ottawa area which led us to our next methodological problem. Facebook knew our RAs. Every time they went to go out and do one of these searches, because Facebook knew who they were, they kept throwing up their friends. So we want to know somebody in Ottawa, here's your 12 friends. And we didn't want their 12 friends for obvious reasons. Um, and it, so, so, so we, we thought, okay, how do we get around this? So the next thing we tried is uh, we had our RAs create fake Facebook accounts and go in again. Didn't work because they were using the same IP address. So one of our RAs actually went home to Toronto and used her mom's computer to get <laughs> most of our sample because it was the only way we could fool Facebook well enough to get the search results that we were looking for which I think is just an interesting methodological and theoretical moment on the operation of surveillance. Um, when we did get this sample, the amazing thing was that we did not find a multiplicity of girls. In fact, we found no variety of, at all. We found a monolithic representation of a very particular kind of femininity. Thin, fashionable, highly sexualized, and uh, a girl who gave the prominent, the best real estate on her Facebook page to her boyfriend. <gasps> my boyfriend loves me. He's so sweet. We've been together six months. It's our anniversary. Here's a picture of me and my boyfriend. Uh, one of our research uh, uh, participants later on explained that by saying, oh, he's her purse. He's her accessory on Facebook. We all do that kind of thing. Um, now, just to underline how monolithic this performance was, we looked at 1,500 Facebook profiles, and we found one outlier, which is pretty darn scary. So this was very, very uh, common. Um, so we figured, well, that's okay. We're going to use our qualitative research to see what kinds of performances occur on private Facebook pages. We knew we had looked at public pages. We were going to get consent from these girls. We could talk about... Um, you know, their, their, their own performances in, their own, in the context of their own lived experiences. But at the same time, we became fascinated with the presence of this monolithic representation. And we wanted to talk to our research participants about how they read it. What does this mean to you? Um, how do you, do, do you do this kind of stuff to your friends? Is this something that you only see on public pages? Because it was just so inherently fascinating because it was just so monolithic. Um, which led us to a second ethical dilemma. Uh, we, we were concerned that, that certainly in previous qualitative work that I've done with kids, it's very, very clear that when you pop up a, an image of, of that kind of performance, kids get very judgmental very quickly. And we did not want to take our research participants to these public pages and say, so, what do you think of that? You know, just how shallow do you think Sally <laughs> is being when she's doing the duck face in the mirror for the 16th time kind of thing? So, so to get around that methodological problem, we developed a composite, which I know some of you have seen, Tiffany. Uh, we took the elements that appeared on those 1,500 pages and created a fake page. I'm really good. The only Facebook pages I actually have are all fake, so I'm, I'm a pro at this if you want to know how to do it. Uh, but we created a fake page called Tiffany Summers, and, and we wanted to talk to uh, girls about that particular image uh, or representation or performance, and that led to another methodological problem. Uh, we were concerned that since Tiffany is a composite of, of stereotypes which are incredibly common on, in the mediascape in which we all live, 
that if we introduced our discussions by saying, let's talk about Tiffany, it would really bias the findings we got. We would frame our discussions through stereotypes. And that's precisely what we didn't want to do. So again, we came to a fairly uncomfortable solution, but I think it actually worked. We, we, in our discussion guide, we designed it that we would talk to girls about their lived experiences, collect that data, and then introduce Tiffany. And, and I, I think that that decision was justified by the fact that every single participant that we talked to said, oh God, Tiffany, I know, that's a normal girl. She's an ordinary 17-year-old. Everybody's got a tip in their friends list because you have to, that's street cred. If, if uh, you don't want to hang out with people like that necessarily, but you want one of them on your friends list because that sort of gives you legitimacy. I'm performing femininity well enough that, that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm comfortable with uh, the way people are going to read um, uh, my particular Facebook presentation. Um, the, the, um, the, we did go through a process, and I don't know how successful it was, uh, where we wanted girls to interact with the policy debates. And so to do that, we used quotes. We would say, this is what policymakers say about your lives. True, not so true. What part resonates with you? What part doesn't? Mm -hmm. And we haven't gone through the analysis yet, and we did get some interesting data. So I hesitate to say this, but I, I, I think we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. I think we have to think more creatively about ways to engage kids with policy debates. Because a number of the girls, particularly the younger girls, I did mention they were from 15 to 22, the 15 to 17 year olds sort of went, policy makers, oh yes, I agree with them. So even though they would have said five minutes ago, well, it's so stupid that everyone places me under surveillance, and then you'd read one of these quotes and they go, well, policy makers must know what they were talking about. <laughs> so we have to think a bit more about how to get to, to, to uh, get a, a good data set to, to really explore those kinds of research questions. Um, but I, I would say that the most important methodological lesson, okay, I've got two seconds. The most important, I, started, I didn't see any one. <laughs> you went from five to zero, it's his fault. <laughs> I don't, he's lying now. Play back the tapes, you know. Okay. <laughs> the most important methodological lesson that I think I personally took away with it was that by fluke, because we were testing a focus group in our first uh, time in the field, we used both interviews and focus groups. And what I learned is that if you want to learn about the performance of gender in online spaces, man, if you put a bunch of girls that are 15 years of age into a room, they will perform for each other. And, and so much of the focus group had to do with them claiming their gender territory. So I go back to the boyfriend that was so important to Tiffany. Within 10 minutes of every focus group we did, every single girl without being an asked had slipped in, well, I have a boyfriend, well, of course I have, well, my boyfriend says. And, and then if you didn't have a boyfriend, the girls would say, well, I don't have a boyfriend now, but that's because I just dumped him. Um, which, which tells you that that's an excellent opportunity to, to observe those group dyma dynamics, because gender is something that we collectively construct in our interactions with each other. Um, However, the interviews were an incredibly rich way to watch a young woman become more self-reflexive about these issues and the meanings that they have for her in her lived experience. So, so my takeaway was that there were a number of methodological lessons to be learned about um, looking at the performance of gender and, and how it interacts with surveillance and social media spaces. But I would highly recommend this hybrid method where you do talk to girls in groups, but you also talk to girls one-on-one because -on -one, mm -hmm. you'll get very different data. Thank you for the extra.